Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Strategenius Member School Spotlight featuring Charles Armstrong School. Um, today, we'll be um, having an, our one-hour um, focus on the Charles Armstrong School and its community, culture, and programming. But before we launch into this exciting program, I'd like to say a few words about our firm. Since 2021, Strategies is one of the only BIPOC-owned search firms partnering exclusively with independent schools throughout the United States. From the start, our core intent is to promote and champion equity and belonging in education by improving diversity among independent school teachers and leaders. For us, we see everything through a relational lens. Schools and educators are our partners and not customers or just commodities. Let's talk a little bit about the educators that we partner with. Our educators are diverse in so many ways and dimensions, whether they're just starting out or ready to become head of school. The thread that connects our educators is their passion for DEIJB and their desire to seek out communities and schools that embrace and celebrate DEIJB. Our consultants have decades of experience mentoring and coaching educators. And we're especially proud of how we've built relationships that span entire careers. We also take pride in supporting organizations and conferences that center diverse educators and equity. We're a major sponsor of POC. And if any of you are out there in San Antonio, um, I hope you stop by and say hello. We also partner with member schools and our member schools um, are diverse but they also have the common thread that connects them and that is their commitment to DEIJB. As their partners, we push our member schools to think critically about the recruitment, hiring and retention practices as it pertains to diverse educators. Over 130, we have over 130 member schools right now and most of them are located on the East and West Coast. Each school is unique in its own way and we feel really lucky to get to know them when we visit and work with them. We know that it's really hard sometimes for educators like you to get really get to know a school because we know that like a website or social media post can't always convey everything that makes this place special. So to bridge this gap, we are hosting the member school spotlights to give a school like the Charles Armstrong School the stage, the stage and to let them share with educators what makes their school special and unique. So today, the Member School Spotlight is an information session tailored to educators who want to learn more about this school. Administrators and teachers are going to talk about this school today, its culture and its programming and other unique aspects of the school. At the end, um, we're going to have a short question and answer session. And I know that this is a recorded um, program, but if you have any questions that um, you would that we didn't cover today, please email them to Strategenius and we will um, forward them to uh, Charles Armstrong and get back to you. As I said, uh, we're, we're recording this spotlight and um, please come back and reference this at any time. We're gonna have it posted on our website. So without further delay, I am extremely excited to shine the spotlight on Charles Armstrong. Um, I want to turn over the mic to my colleague, Dr. Ara Brown, who will introduce um, the school. Ara. Thank you, Joyce. I appreciate that. Hello, everyone. My name is Ara Brown, and I have the privilege of serving as a senior search consultant with Strategenius. And it is my great honor to introduce the Charles Armstrong School, uh, an amazing institution that supports students in grades two through eight. Uh, who have dyslexia and related learning differences. Now, I had uh, the distinct pleasure of getting to know them very well when we supported them with their search for a director of diversity, equity, and in inclusion and belonging. Um, the school is led by a dynamic and personable head of school and their commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging really is palpable. Uh, not surprising, the school lives their publicly stated values of helping students to embrace challenges and cultivate resilience, self-awareness and advocacy on a daily basis. 
Uh, the school really is a place where students' strengths are nurtured, they're developed, uh, and they are definitely celebrated. More specifically, it's a place where a student's learning differences is seen as their superpower. And it's because the school is where students and faculty feel very safe and definitely supported. So without further ado, I would love to turn things over to our proud partner, the Charles Armstrong School. All right, great. I will take over from here. So hi, everyone. I am Annie Fawn. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and work closely with Strategenius, which was such a transformative experience for me to work with both the firm and now the school. So it's been such a pleasure. Um, before we get started, I wanted to also give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves. So I will pass it over to have our Rachel, and then we'll go from there. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Rachel Cunningham. I am the Director of Teaching and Learning at Armstrong. And I'll give it to Sarah. Hello, my name is Sarah Fox. I'm the director of lower school as well as the director of research. And I will hand it to Brandon. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am Brandon Lee. I'm the director of the middle school. And I will pass it over to Laura. Hello, um, my name is Laura Amador. And I, this is my fourth year as an art teacher at Armstrong and a member of the newly started uh, DEIB committee. And I will pass it over to Alyssa. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Alyssa Whirl, and I am the chief of staff at Armstrong. Thanks for being here. I will pass it over to Neil. Hi, everybody. Neil Tuck, really great to have you join us today. Uh, and Ara, thank you for the very kind introduction. I am the head of school and I look forward to working with you all. And I will pass it to... Let's I think see. it's back to me. Oh yeah, I guess back to Annie. <laughs> all right, so I will get us st started. Today we are gonna share with you all five reasons to join the Charles Armstrong community as an adult um, employee here. And there are so many reasons why I have loved working here. It's really just been a pleasure and a place for me to grow from day one. Um, but the top five, I think, are pretty compelling. But first of all, we wanted to start with some quick facts. So I will start us through that. And here are some photos of our lovely, lovely students. Um, so we are on a 4.5 acre campus in the San Francisco Bay Area. We get beautiful, if sometimes finicky weather. Um, on a lovely campus, we serve 240 students, grades two through eight. So it doesn't take long to not only get to know your own students, but the entire school. We were founded in 1968 and a few years ago celebrated our 50th anniversary. So we are a long established institution here in the Bay Area and as well as being experts on what we do. We have a really lovely student teacher ratio of 4.5 students to one. This means that our students get a lot of individualized personalized attention and it means that as teachers we really get to dig deep into those relationships. Um, on top of that, we, and as a result, we um, have structured literacy and math small group instruction, which has been a game changer for me as an educator to learn more about how we are approaching both those things. And we'll speak, speak to that more later. And we are also the five and five. So what that means is that typically in the uh, general community, students with dyslexia and people with dyslexia number one and five over 20%. But an amazing thing about what we do here is that all of our students have dyslexia. Yeah, so they are the five and five, and that sense of affinity and community creates something really special here. All right, I want to read our mission. Um, at Armstrong, we are all very focused and committed on our mission. Charles Armstrong School unlocks the unique potential of students with dyslexia and related learning differences, changing the trajectory of their lives. This is a... Um, it's pretty concise and it's a really nice guiding mission for us all. Sorry, you can go ahead. <laughs> How do we get there? Um, we we have uh, several categories of, um, of programs and activities that get us there. Our research, our collaborative partnerships um, with a couple of outside UCSF and HMH, our DEIB, we have great work in curriculum and um, and coaching and overall um, moving forward in that area. And finally, differentiated and personalized instruction for our students. 
So yeah, I'm going to go over the five really quickly, and then we're going to each split it up and give some in-depth detail from there. So here are our five reasons. Number one, we understand students with dyslexia in and out of the classroom. Two, we understand dyslexia. Three, we understand teaching students with dyslexia, and we recognize that's being different from the other two. Four, we are deeply committed to building community through diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. In fact, we're not afraid to laugh and have, at ourselves and have some fun. So hopefully you'll see some of that today. So number one, we understand students with dyslexia in and out of the classroom. So if you're thinking to yourself right now, like, I don't quite know if I know that yet, that is totally fine. We have many teachers who come join our community um, without the experience, and we are invested in all our teachers in growing and learning together and making sure that we are supporting our students. Next slide, please. So when you walk into Charles Armstrong, you walk into a classroom, it's going to feel a little bit different. It's our classrooms, our entire school is structured around supporting our students um, and their learning needs. And we do not have a high school. There are no ninth grade, ninth grade, eighth graders at Charles Armstrong. So we, all our students, um, we have the goal of mainstreaming all our students after, after the eighth grade year. So we we're working with them and supporting them and how to teach them how to understand their learning differences, how to advocate for themselves, um, and get the resources that they need uh, to be successful in school. So I'm not going to go over every single one of these things, but this is... Um, just some of the things that you would notice if you, when you come to our school, we have flexible seating. So our students, um, they choose the, how they best learn. We have seats that rise, some students stand, we have standing desks, we have soft seating. Um, students will move around based on, on what they need. All our students have iPads, um, so our one-to-one -one school, and we have smart boards in every single classroom. And we actually like really teach and work with our students to understand how to use this technology, right? So we have um, a technology integration specialist and our smart boards actually get used, which has been different for me compared to some other schools. Um, our smart, our, uh, we have small group instruction. So our schedule is based around our language instruction. We, all our students get daily language instruction. Um, so that's like reading instruction on top of writing instruction as well. And these, these happen in small groups um, in both literacy and in math. So these are just some things to so quickly run through them. You know, our library looks different. It's very dyslexia friendly. Um, we have lots of electives. Our focus on language does not drive us away from all aspects of child development. So we have music, we have art, we have movement, we have electives. This quarter we have um, various sports. We've had pickleball, we had chess, we have sign language, um, and then we have a very thorough next school placement um, process as well built in for our eighth graders and our eighth grade families to make sure that we are setting our students up for success afterwards after Charles Armstrong. Yeah, I wanted to take a moment to maybe call in Laura as a teacher. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to add in terms of the things that we do to kind of support the whole child here at Armstrong. Absolutely. I wanted to jump in and say, you know, speaking of spaces, we have an awesome art room. And, you know, when we talk about the small group instruction, that means, um, you know, we can get really creative with projects and help kids one-on-one. -on -one. And that applies to athletics and PE as well. And, and I think a, a lot of our students have strengths um, outside of academics as well. And we want to give them a chance to shine and um, get to know them in different ways too. And so that's something that I'm really glad that Armstrong really holds on to and values still. Thanks so much, Lana. Let's move on to the next one. Um, so, oh, go ahead. So this is just a little quote from our one of our coaches, um, Corey, and I'll read a little bit of it. For me, students with dyslexia are an underserved population, and here they are the five and five, with teachers, administration, and staff understanding and consistently supporting strategies and curriculum that meet the needs of students with dyslexia. As a special educator in the public school system, I had to engage in battles with colleagues and administrators to get services that students need, and here it is all embedded in the culture. So I think this is something that a lot of the folks who work here have had experience with in the public schools. I'm sure many of you listening have had experience with the public schools, and this is something that really 
is special about Charles Armstrong is just how embedded all these all these services, everything that we're doing is so guided by our mission um, and embedded within the structures of our school. Yeah, and I would also echo that like um, these are things from also the other side, like other independent schools don't necessarily build their whole program around these support systems the way that we do. So I think that whether you're coming from either side, um, there's a lot of benefit and it's a totally new teaching and learning experience here. Great, I think we move on to the next one. So this is me, um, short and sweet. We understand dyslexia. Um, I, I want to pause for a moment and go back to what we were just talking about regarding um, a different type of teaching and learning experience. Um, I uh, came to Armstrong 11 years ago, not having any dyslexia experience. And I have found here that this has been a job where I have grown so much as an educator and my practice because of the care that goes into understanding um, what dyslexia is and all of the related challenges that go along with it and how to support those kids in the classroom. Um, and that goes directly to the next slide, which is um, all of our research partnerships. Um, what we know about dyslexia now is has is so different than what we, what I came into 11 years ago. Um, and that just shows how much dyslexia is not only being researched on a daily basis, but how it's, it changes and not one student is alike. Um, so we have a partnership with the dyslexia center at UCSF that have, uh, we started back in 2013. Um, and it has grown to, um, really help identify um, instructional best practices in the classroom and, and we're doing instructional trials now. Um, and it started just by wanting to understand um, a dyslexic brain better. Um, and so the UCSF Center came to us and partnered and we have, uh, we're doing what's called a phenotyping study. Um, and this phenotyping study is showing us different ways that students um, identify in their brain on how they they learn best. Um, and with that, we're just learning about um, ways that we as teachers and educators can approach um, instruction in the classroom. Um, our school is Wilson, uh, a Wilson school. So Wilson Reading System is a, a research-backed curriculum that helps students break down um, words and break the code of, of the English language, um, which is it's structured and systematic and it really tailors to the needs of our students. Um, you'll see, you see a whole bunch of other pictures on here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our Hugh Mifflin Harcourt partnership. Um, this partnership has been really fabulous because we've been able to work with them um, directly in tailoring uh, specific uh, specific curriculum that they have to fit the needs of dyslexic students. And we've actually been able to inform them in changing some of the things so that it will actually help um, other students in public schools and also other you know dyslexic students around the world. Um, we are learning a lot more about math and dyscalculia at this point in our journey with UCSF. Um, and what we know now is um, we don't know a lot. <laughs> and so we keep learning um, that our students, just like dyslexia, um, dyscalculia shows up very differently in a lot of our students. And we're, we are dedicated and um, committed to figuring out ways to provide a better um, math approach for some of our students um, and also just researching and seeing what we can do differently. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say is the little penguin in the corner is, um, is it Gigi, I think? And Gigi is ST math, which is actually developed by a dyslexic learner. And we are, um, we are using it in our class for, for students who, um, who struggle, but also a lot of students who are just needing that extra practice. Um, and it actually has no words whatsoever. It is just a uh, visual representation. Um, so yeah. One thing I'll just end in is that uh, dyslexia is not dyslexia is not dyslexia. So when you come here, we look at our um, teachers as student researchers, um, 
not just teachers. We want to make sure that every student that you have wonders about and questions about that you're using that that research um, side and that questioning, that curiosity. And that's what I think is so um, magical about this place because you're constantly learning and um, tr and doing and trying different things to help out the students in your classroom. All right, <clears throat> now, now it's for me. We understand teaching students with dyslexia. And I wanna say before we move to the next slide that um, to Sarah's point before, we don't expect to get teachers who are already experts in how to teach students with dyslexia. So we have a lot of things in place to make sure that we help our teachers um, move forward in their understanding and in their professional practice. All right. We have a very robust professional development program. Um, we start out with a, a summer teaching institute. We have a, a new teacher uh, training before that every year for anyone joining us new. Everyone who joins us does the introductory training for Wilson Reading System because it gives a really, really solid foundation in understanding dyslexic learners. Um, and also we use responsive classroom as our approach to classroom management and to social emotional learning. We have that as a framework and a common language in our school, which is um, extremely helpful. We make sure everyone gets trained in responsive classroom. And each week we have the afternoon of Wednesday. It's a, um, it's a minimum day for our students and our teachers have a couple of hours devoted to professional development on an ongoing basis. Um, we have a team of instructional coaches who are really supportive of all of our teachers. Of course, our Wilson trainer, but we have coaches in other who specialize in other areas and generally in supporting teachers to understand and learn and utilize best practices with dyslexic learners. We also have a speech and language um, consultant who is incredibly helpful and supportive to all of our teachers and um, in, in our research work as well. And finally, we have a great we have a great situation here in which we are able to work together as adults a great deal. Team teaching together in classrooms, which is pretty unique. Um, and that it allows with our instructional coaches and teaching partnerships, the professional development is really embedded in every day for our teachers here. And it really helps us to keep moving forward and improving. We have team coordinators for each grade level. Oh, Laura, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt, but I just wanted to emphasize when you were done um, how supported I felt as a teacher coming in here, not having taught dyslexic students before. Um, I was kind of nervous to come in for my demonstration lesson, um, but that actually went really well and felt really good. And when I came, I, I did like read a um, some recommended books ahead of time, but like the dyslexia simulation was huge at the orientation. That was so helpful. And, um, having a team teacher. So I co-teach with my partner, Christy, who has 15 years of experience specifically with students with dyslexia. Um, she was such a great mentor and somebody to ask questions and run a lesson by to say, Hey, how would, would you think this would go? Um, as well as other colleagues here that anytime, a student is struggling or a lesson doesn't go as expected, there's definitely like, it feels collaborative. There's people to talk to and there's time to process it and make a new plan. So I just wanted to emphasize what you were saying. Thank you so much. I also, the last point I wanted to hit on was the interdisciplinary partnerships. And Laura, you might be able to give us a little more information too, because there have been great um, collaboration between art and social studies and different um, different classes. So we're able to do yeah. that with music and art. So um, like, for example, Sam Beal is doing early humans history project and um, he wanted the kids to be really hands-on. And this year he's trying something new, which I love. And he had them make artifacts um, and then to go bury them and dig them up and teams identify um, what early humans they would have been part of. So, you know, he came and we, we talked about materials and helped him out with some paint and things like that. And it's just, it's just natural. Like, come talk to me. If you have an idea, we want to make things happen and anything that can make 
an experience more hands-on or more in-depth for students, people do all the time. I know Makerspace does it, music does it, um, writing is involved as well. So everybody works together here a lot. Thank you. Great. Um, Rachel, anything else or do we want to move on to the next one? I'm good. Thank you. I would just add, um, so I think out of the seven instructional coaches, two of those include me and Rachel as the directors of teaching and learning and the director of diversity, ed equity, inclusion, and belonging, which kind of leads me into my next thing. Um, the reason why I chose Armstrong is because I really felt like they didn't just talk the talk, they really walked the walk in terms of a sincere commitment to DEIB. So for me, that was the draw for me personally, and I hope it's the draw for everybody. Also, these kids are just really freaking cute. Um, but here's like a little sample of what we've been up to so far. So um, we really think through multicultural programming um, across the entire school. And it's been such a joy and a blessing to see everyone be all hands on deck when it comes to this stuff. So in October, it is Dyslexia Awareness Month. And this year we decided to theme it around the idea of you are not alone, right? Because even though our students know they're the five and five now, all of them have had this experience of feeling like once upon a time they were the one in five or they were the one in 32, right? Um, and so it was an opportunity for them to reflect. And we did this wonderful author event with our very own PE teacher, Mr. Scott Douthit, who has written a book about his own experiences uh, with dyslexia. And that was just like a moving, lovely experience for both the middle school and lower school where, you know, our language teachers in middle school, like, read an excerpt or a chapter from the book, and then we had questions, and the lower school students were just so lovely and, you know, gave a standing ovation and had really wonderful, thoughtful questions. So we really think about dyslexia and not just as, like, you know, a something that impacts their experience in the classroom, but we know that this is deeply a part of our students' identities. And so a lot of what we do is about building up a positive identity on multiple fronts, which includes things like having a middle school gender and sexuality alliance and a recently formed lower school pride group, which is lovely. Um, art teachers like Laura and Christy and other teachers participate in programming and support for things like Dia de los Muertos or Native American Heritage Month. Um, we <clears throat> join in on San Francisco Pride. We have a, our racial literacy curriculum through Pollyanna and that's being implemented second through eighth grade. And we're working to integrate it even more deeply into our social studies programming. I am here in San Antonio right now with two of our uh, non-faculty staff, which is exciting for us at the People of Color Conference. And I'm really excited about our commitment to that. And then on top of that, and I'll jump into the next one, the equity part is really important, right? So not only do we do the fun stuff, the programming, the curriculum, but we also mean that at a base level, we know that adults and students alike need to be treated right when they work and learn here. So for employees, what this looks like is that we make sure to benchmark to the 75th percentile at least, and in many cases we are more than that. The schools of similar size in the San Francisco Bay Area, we know that cost of living is tough everywhere, especially in California. And so we have a real commitment to making sure that we are thoughtful about how we approach that. Um, this includes great benefits. And a lovely thing that I learned upon coming here is a 1% employer match up to 6% automatic contribution for retirement stuff. Sometimes that sounds confusing, but I know it's a good thing. Um, and we care about people's wellness. So this includes a $400 wellness stipend. Um, and we also care about continued learning. Again, this work is not easy, but it's so rewarding and really supporting people's growth in that. The fiscally is important. For students and family, what this looks like is that 30% of our students receive some tuition assistance um, with 90% of expected family contribution. This includes stipends, so it's not just like we're covering tuition, that's it. We know that this impacts the entire experience for our students. So there are stipends for the book fair, our outdoor education trips, the eighth grade DC trip, et cetera. And on top of that, we do coordinate with Bay Area nonprofits for additional grants. So we are constantly trying to make sure, like, where are the gaps <laughs> in experience? And what can we do to make sure that this, like, learning journey for our students at Armstrong is therapeutic and holistic throughout? We aren't afraid to laugh at ourselves and have fun. So this is a huge part of our school. Uh, joy is just a huge component of our school. And it's important because so many of our students haven't had that experience necessarily in their previous schools. Like it's a very common theme of um, students who come to us and parents that they 
have had experience where like they have felt alone or they didn't vibe with school and it just wasn't fitting for them. And they come here and everything's changed because the school is built around them and built around their needs. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanna give you a quick little example of this. Unfortunately, our video is not working right now, but um, what you see on the left there is some of our uh, teachers, faculty, staff, um, is our head of school in there as well. Yes, um, dressed up as Vikings. And this is part of a seventh grade project. Um, our history teacher, Ms. Folger, taught where students were um, diving deep into medieval history and as a component of that were building castles. Um, and they're learning all about those different aspects, castles um, and everything incorporated within that and how it involves um, how history is integrated into that. Um, but to cap off this experience, um, everyone gathered together and we threw uh, dodgeballs at their, at their castles until it all fell apart. And I think it was just, it was a beautiful, joyful, silly experience. And um, it was so great to see these students work so hard on these projects for four weeks and then just feel so comfortable absolutely demolishing them. Um, and these are the kind of things that we do. We just watched the, had a whole school World Cup watching yesterday. We um, just, lots of joy, lots of fun um, on the day to day. It's probably good that the video doesn't work because it, it is kind of shocking to the kids how excited we get to destroy their work. But it's a, it's a, it is truly a loving moment, even though it may not sound that way. Right. Any other things that people want to echo regarding joy at our school before I move on to the last two slides? I mean, I would just say, oh, sorry. Uh, I would just say that, um, you know, this is an example of middle school and the lower school students themselves bring so much joy to our lives um, that uh, just being out on second grade recess and watching these kids interact with each other. And um, I think our teachers come together to celebrate those successes all the time. And um, we do, we do, I know it sounds cheesy as it is, we really do what we do because of the kids and they are um, such an important part of our joy. Um, and that's, that's why we have fun. I got a lower school story really quick. I just, uh, so you don't know this yet. I just jumped into the movement class with Miss Springs and I taught all the second graders how to sign somewhere over the rainbow, the is version. And it's gonna be so cute when they present during the winter concert. Yeah, I think we, I think each of us has like a story every day. It's such a pleasure for me to join in any meeting. Like it's so natural for people to just come and be like, oh my God, you just like won't believe what kind of interaction I had in my language class or, you know, I was just walking down the hallway and then I had a lovely experience with these students and they were so kind and so sweet and so funny, right? So we're here, it's really important. And I think for me, it speaks to like the reason why the phrasing here is we aren't afraid to laugh at ourselves is because like humility is a part of learning, right? Like, and recognizing that our students have so much to teach us and to be kind of level with them is a really humbling but also rewarding experience. Um, so in sum, we have, I'm gonna skip over the video just because it's a little laggy, <clears throat> a quote that kind of summarizes everything for us by one of our instructional coaches, Sean Wright. Um, he says, Armstrong has been a game changer for my teaching career. It's the rare school setting that provides teachers with structured, research-based curriculum training and pedagogy, as well as the freedom to take creative risks as an educator and pursue their own personal professional development interests. At Armstrong, we are given the opportunity to grow into great teachers of students with dyslexia, as well as well-rounded, compassionate members of a very special and supportive learning community. So yeah, that is it from us. We really appreciate your time. And I think from here, I will stop sharing. And I think we're transitioning into some questions from Joyce and Hua. Yes, thank you so much for sharing about your community. Um, I know we are all in different parts of the state, but you can definitely feel the love that you have for each other and the school. And as someone that was in education, there's nothing like being going to work and loving what you do every day. I mean, of course, there's trials and tribulations, but being able to find joy and laugh and share those moments are so special. 
And it's so nice to hear that that's what you have because that is something that you can't teach. You can't teach people to care, but you can teach people the skill set to be able to teach others. But caring for one another is definitely truly a treat to be able to be part of. Um, so we have some questions as some educators would be looking at your school, someone would be moving far. So um, the first question is, where was home for y'all? Were you not, were you born in the Bay Area? Did you move to the Bay Area? How was your move? Like, how was that transition for y'all? I, uh, I moved from Florida. I taught in Miami for nine years, but I grew up in Alabama. So California was a big leap for me. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of challenges here, but you really, it's kind of uh, the most amazing place. Northern California is amazing. The Bay Area is wonderful. There's so much to do and see and so much diversity. I really enjoy it. And I don't want to ever leave. <laughs> I'll probably have to when I retire. I was born in the Bay Area. I uh, grew up about 30 minutes south of here. Um, so for all the the local folks thinking of joining us, uh, we're like an amazing part of the Bay Area, we're like right smack dab in the middle of the peninsula. We have a beautiful view and it's, it's great for um, because we're so centrally located. We have people coming here from San Francisco. We have people coming from the South Bay. We have people coming from the East Bay um, and we serve students in all these geographical locations as well. I'm I'm originally from Southern California, so I'm just a California person. Um, but I have been living in Northern California for the last 20 years. So I just absolutely love Northern California. I love what it offers. It's, um, it is, if you are an outdoorsy person, you can be outdoors 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Literally you can, if you want. And, um, that's what I love about it. Um, and I do, I was going to say with Brandon too, it's really nice because it is, I live, um, up in like really Northern California, Northern, Northern part of California. And, um, I, uh, the commute is really not that bad because of the fact that like you come to a school that is just like so wonderful to be at. It doesn't, I've been doing it for 11 years and I've commuted an hour, um, one way. So that's like, it's been, been pretty great. And from a practical standpoint, I'll just add in that we do offer moving expenses. So if people are relocating from other parts of the country, we're, we try to be very understanding about that. And our faculty and staff has been amazing at welcoming newcomers and helping them understand different areas to potentially live in and where they live and then welcoming them for holidays and things like that if they don't have any local family. So we really try to do, uh, we really try to be a warm welcoming community. For folks that are not familiar with the Bay Area, what is it like around your school? What is that community? How would you describe it? This one's a tricky one. It This is a tricky one. So it's hard because I don't, so we're in Belmont. And I don't think a lot of, I could be wrong, but I don't think a lot of teachers live in Belmont. Um, we each have like our own home bases and we come here and, you know, there's like our favorite restaurants and takeout places around here. And there's the shopping center. And I wish, I don't know. I, um, it's good. It's, it's well located for a commute because it's like right off 101 and right over the bridge. And, um, yeah, I I think that I'm I don't know what to say. Sorry, I should have said. That. I would say that I would say the neighboring communities are pretty excellent, like the Burlingame and San Carlos, um, San Mateo, um, all of the places uh, that are are around Belmont um, have. Uh, there's like outdoor shops and different um, parts of the community that is really, really nice. I would say Belmont. I mean, we're up on a hill. It's beautiful. It's lo it, like all of that. But Belmont, the city itself is very, very small. And the other cities around it um, really make it like the more enjoyable. Yeah, I think from like a relocation standpoint, if this is something people are thinking about, like 
it's not that, you know, people, if you're going to work here in Belmont, then most people choose to live in Belmont again because of its central location. So I live in San Francisco um, and it was great because I didn't have to move, right? I could just stick to the wonderful home I've been living in for the past six years and also have this pretty straightforward commute. It's usually 20 minutes in the morning and fine. And having a parking spot is nice, which we have. So go us. Um, and so I think like if someone's thinking about relocating, like you don't have to live in San Francisco if that's not your vibe. You might want to try Los Altos and San Mateo. You might be like, I love Oakland and San Leandro on the East Bay, right? And, and that's a community I feel connected to or want to dig into. So you actually have your pick um, on terms of the type of vibe you're looking for, really urban, a little more suburban, um, and kind of the multicultural communities that come with each of those places. And just a clarifying point for our, like our East Coasters who are listening in and perhaps even our Southern Californians who haven't spent too much time in Northern California. So we just rattled off like 30 cities. And this is not like, oh, you're in like New York and it's like two hours to get through New York and San Diego is like, I don't know, a bajillion miles all the way across. Or if like you're in Boston and you're like, you know, Boston is just, is just Boston, right? So it's like San Carlos could be a neighborhood in a, um, in another city, in another city right it could be like belmont is like super super tiny so we're rattling off all these places because each of these places have like a little bit of the character or culture but they're almost it almost at times it's more like like the whole peninsula feels like one like urban area one city um and then like each of these little towns or these cities within it are actually more like um sub areas like within that Thank you for the clarification because someone as an East Coaster, I needed that because I was not familiar. Um, so let's talk, I mean, in the presentation, you talked about some of the things that you're doing as a community. What are some of your favorite traditions that you do at the school? Oh, easily the talent show. <laughs> it's the best. We have the best talent shows. We do a lower school and we do a middle school. And they are just unmatched, in my humble opinion, um, because our students are so creative and so talented in just unexpected ways. Um, I mean, we I can't even remember all the things. The We had somebody give like a, um, a language lesson, a Korean language lesson by video for the, for the um, talent show last year and everything from dancing, gymnastics, sports talents, all kinds of different things. And the then my other, my second favorite is our graduation because our students, their, their lives do change when they're here. And it's amazing, especially if you've known them since lower school, to see them as eighth graders. And we have student speakers at our eighth grade dinner and our eighth grade graduation, and they, they speak to their own experience. And it's amazing. I'll add, um, not only did we join the San Francisco Pride Parade, we had our first uh, Armstrong Pride Parade on campus last year. Uh, we have we have one golf cart. We uh, or we basically do, we, uh, we decorated as a float. Uh, it was very much student driven, which was amazing. Not the golf cart itself, but the the decorations and the uh, and the parade. And we literally paraded around campus for like twenty minutes to a half hour. Picked up lots of other students, wave flags. Uh, kids had made their own sort of signs and things and it was just so joyous and so fun and it was great because students uh, who are active in that community really felt the support of the greater community you know right in front of them on our own campus so that's a relatively new tradition but one that I'm sure will be carrying on for a long time. And I just wanted to add as a annual tradition, we have a school musical that we put on in the spring and it is a highlight for everyone in our community. Um, our specialty program, especially our movement and music teachers put on an incredible performance using mainly um, our middle school students, but the lower school students, if they have an interest can participate as well in some of the ensemble numbers and as a school, we all make a special trip to the theater together as a community event, and we get to watch everybody and celebrate their gifts and talents. And then we have two nights of shows, and our entire community comes out more than once to see um, all of the amazing students um, really performing. So it's incredible. We're, and we're really quickly, Spam all at Junior this year, and it's sure to be amazing and hilarious. 
And real quick, just add on to that, our amazing Makerspace teacher works with students on designing the entire set as well. Okay, my favorite, yeah. oh. I was gonna say, there's also the occasional pranks of one another and other things that are off the record, uh, off the record traditions that are not necessarily ones we advertise to our entire community, but are some of the ways we have some fun behind the scenes. Sorry, Clara. That's okay, I love that. Um, okay, so my favorite thing with students is the students versus teachers soccer game uh, that we had, and I think that's now an annual tradition and it has expanded to other sports. It's a blast. It's really fun. Um, and then I also love our weekly lunches. So just want to shout out that like, um, it's just nice to have a time where lunch is taken care of and you can just sit and relax and chat with uh, other people. Um, so that's really great. In your presentation, you touched upon, you know, the, when you get back from summer as a new faculty member, there's a training, a robust training, talking about all the things that they need to know about being a teacher slash educator in your community. Um, what other kind of professional development do you offer for new teachers or experienced teachers to continue their growth, um, to be able to showcase slash role model that learning does just not stop because you're older, but as you're all learning too. So how do you do that? How do you support the education component? We have a variety of ways. Um, there is a, we have a professional development request form. If a teacher wants to go and do a professional development outside, they just request it. And if they work with their coach to find things that are in line with their professional goals, um, and so we're very open to sending people. Um, we send people to IDA and POCC and that Laura is going to an art conference in the spring. Um, so we definitely send people out and we also have, um, like we have an event next week coming up called Taste of Armstrong where our teachers present to each other about the theme this time is innovation and self-care. So innovative instructional approaches and um, and self-care. There's, uh, you know, we have um, all kinds of things going on, little half hour sessions. There's a there's a CrossFit, there's a Zumba, uh, there's holiday crafting, and there's also a lot of new instructional practices. So we are, um, you know, always on the lookout for um, in, for creative ways to make sure our teachers are um, supported and moving forward professionally with their own goals. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, our, and what would I add first? There's a bunch of things. Um, I think one thing I'm thinking of is like our instructional coaches meet on a regular cycle. So Rachel and I and our five coaches, and that includes a math specialist, our Wilson trainer. Um, we have people like a speech and language pathology expert, right? Like, and all of us come together. We're listening to the needs of the teachers on a day-by-day -day basis when we're having one-on-ones with them. And sometimes like things emerge out of that too, right? So from that, we reformed a literacy team and we're developing like, what's our like philosophy around literacy? See that it extends beyond just like decoding and encoding words, but we have a real belief about the reason why our students should be literate in our society and what to do with that, right? And so we're doing literacy lunches now, right? And people can kind of pop, pop by or, you know, our math specialist noticed that um, some lower school teachers wanted some help with thinking through different ways of reconceptualizing subtraction, right, for our students. So she did like a, like a subtraction lunch and people came by, right? And so um, there's kind of an adaptive quality to it as well. And again, I want to highlight the local resources of the San Francisco Bay Area. One of the reasons why I chose to stay and work in this area is because you know, in San Francisco, there's the University of San Francisco, Teachers for Social Justice, there's the Graduate School of Education at Stanford, and they do an annual conference. Like, the area itself is really, like, flush with resources, and it's really easy to just, like, sign up for a workshop, do a half-day seminar on a Saturday, right, and we're really supportive of all of that here. I'm also hosting a, um, a book club with the new teachers that came in this year. It's a, um, a book called Onward about cultivating your own um, resiliency as an educator. So we have um, monthly, you know, luncheons where we get to check in about that book is set up month by month throughout the school year. And so um, so that's another aspect of our PD. My second to last question is, knowing what you know now, what would you have told your past self about the school? Um, 
I, I think I would tell myself to that. I guess a two, twofold, um, you can do hard things and, um, that this job will change your life. Keep your eye on Sarah Fox. She can never be trusted. <laughs> I think I would tell myself, I, I don't know anything I would tell myself like as a preparation, but I might tell myself, um, congratulations, you found your, your professional home and actually deep friendships that will become like family. Um, I guess I would tell myself um, to maybe relax a little bit <laughs> and, you know, the lesson doesn't have to be perfect the first time and to make sure like I enjoy the relationships with the students that can happen and the little moments in class um, to, to like really emphasize those. I think I would tell myself, and I've had a lot of different roles here as a parent and committee member and CFO and I had a school, I think I would tell myself, you're going to see such transformation in students that any work that lies ahead of you is going to be so well justified because you, you are literally going to see students who come here in second grade need to be walked to the room by their parents, you know, did not have joy in their school lives before they came to Armstrong. And then they're going to get up and speak at graduation seven years later after you've helped somewhere along the way, put in your own little piece of the work, and you're not even going to I'm like tear up here. You're not even going to believe what you're going to see. You're not even going to believe how they're going to present themselves, how they're going to read a speech, how they're going to uh, how they're going to express their feelings about Armstrong and all every every ounce of those seven years of work of getting them from the first day of second grade to the last day of eighth grade, you're not going to question ever because of the transformation you're going to see before your eyes. Neil, you can't make me cry on a recording. Um, I think something that really stood out to me about Armstrong that I, I would reassure myself of because being really honest and transparent like I was like oh strategy is just wonderful they're really clear and I hope that Armstrong's the same way as I was going through the process but I was coming from like a pretty traumatized experience working in public education because things right now are really freaking hard right um everywhere for for schools and I want to be really honest about that and I think that we all want to do right by students, but when structures fall apart, like it starts feeling really performative, right? And that was really painful for me because I was like, I want to do right by kids, but I don't feel like I am in the context that I was. I think here at Armstrong, like what I would tell myself then is that like people really do wear their hearts on their sleeve. Um, so I think that we we have a really honest and authentic culture. Um, where people are willing to say honest things, even if they're messy or complicated, because that's what our students deserve. Like they need us to be, to have integrity about what we're doing, to be like, hey, like maybe we don't have resources right now to support this particular moment for the student. And we are still responsible for doing that. So what are we gonna do, right? And I love that everyone is really willing to like put their foot down and slow down for that moment rather than being like, oh, well, that's just how it is, right? But like, no, that's not. We know that things need to be different for our students. And I, I, I just am amazed by how honest everyone is about that process. Last I would also- Oh, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, I would just add, um, I, would, I would tell myself, like, you are gonna be amazed at the collaborative, creative process that happens um, between and among the Armstrong community and how we really do work together to address the needs, as Annie mentioned. I just, I'm floored every day 
um, about the creativity and the diligence that as a community we put forward um, in order to transform the lives of, of the students that, that come to school here. I can give my real one. <laughs> uh, and it would just be a reassurance to myself that this is where uh, I'm supposed to be. That, you know, they're, you're, you're going to come up with options. Uh, you're going to have plenty of options in front of you. And uh, I am so incredibly glad this is the decision I made. Um, well, Annie said she was going to cry. I feel like I'm going to cry. So we're going to like wrap up all our feelings because feelings are natural. You're able to express them. But any final thoughts, any final things that you want to share with our network of educators? Um, final final words, basically, before we close up. You know, I, I just want to thank Strat Genius. Uh, not only, first of all, you brought us Annie. So we'll forever be indebted for that. But you also brought us a process for how to think about our hiring process. And you know, I think, thought before that we did a pretty good job, but I think we do a much better job now because of the work we did with you in that process and some of the training you brought us through. Uh, so very, uh, very appreciate, very much appreciate that. It's, it's made a, a big difference in how we work. And we're really, uh, we also appreciate the fact you didn't just sort of take us on. You you did your homework and you made sure that we, we not only talked the talk, but actually walked the walk. You came to visit our campus and so appreciative of that. So that's one thing I wanted to add. And a second one I wanted to add is I, I recognize there's a lot of people who are going to see this and are not going to end up at Armstrong. Uh, and one thing I want to make sure that we emphasize enough is we are also very committed as a school um, to develop resources and to give back to the broader community to make sure not only are we touching the students with dyslexia who are lucky enough to end up with the gift of an Armstrong education, but also to help teachers who are in public schools, other independent schools. Uh, and so we're constantly uh, asking ourselves and trying to ask ourselves, frankly, more in the future also, uh, what we can do to help be a resource for all of you. So um, it, it doesn't just end at our doorway and we really feel that sense of obligation and want to make sure that everybody out here hears that message. And I would also just encourage anybody who's interested in coming by if they're local, um, come by, visit visit us at our campus. We are extremely welcoming and happy to have visitors on campus and, and really show off um, the joy that we have on a daily basis. And I want to thank our team for putting together this great presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you for the work that you do on a daily basis and putting joy in the world when sometimes it seems like it's a, a bleak place. And thank you for letting folks in your community feel like they belong, that they are valued, that they're seen and they're heard, and that you're there to grow with them. So thank you so much for the work that you do on a daily basis. Um, and that's all. Have a great day, folks.